Welcome, everybody, and, and thanks for, for hanging with us. We are working live today. Uh, my name is Garrett Schmidt, and I'm the managing editor for BBC Exhibit Hall. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's live, live clearly, webinar uh, hosted <laughs> by Health Data Analytics um, Institute, HDAI. And it's called How Buena Vista uh, or Buena Vida y Salud ACO Uses Predictive Targeting to Help Keep Patients Healthy at Home. Uh, there's a lot of great information that's going to be shared today. And so uh, I know we got a little bit of a late start, so we'll uh, jump right into it. A couple quick items of note before we get started. It's a traditional webinar format today. So everyone's joined in listen-only mode, so you don't need to worry about muting your, yourself or your microphone or anything. Um, we are recording the session, so afterwards you'll receive an email to where there'll be a link to the session as well as to the slides, so you can uh, uh, have all of that information. Uh, and we are going to have a time for some Q&A towards the end. So if you have a, a question at any point during the webinar, go ahead and, and drop it into your question, your, your module there, just a little area for questions. We're going to get to as many as we can. Obviously, our time got cut a little bit short, so if we run out of time or can't get to yours for whatever reason, someone will reach out uh, via email afterwards. So without further ado, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, our speakers today. And actually, I believe, uh, Holly, were you going to do that for us? We'll just go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Magoon and Romana. That's <laughs> that fine. Good. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> no worries. Sorry. No, Welcome, no guys. Problem. Thank you. So I'm Dr. Sheila Magoon. I am family practice and I am the executive director for uh, Buena Vida y Salud. Romanis? Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Romanis, I'm the Director of Care Optimization at HDI. Um, I'm a nurse by trade, and my primary areas of focus is around care coordination, care management, quality, and process improvement. Um, uh, it, it has been an honor to collaborate with Dr. Magoon and her team on this case study. Thank you. Go ahead, next slide. So Buena Vida y Salud is a Medicare Shared Savings Program ACO, and you have a little bit of background information, and that's from 2023, because this particular case study is in related to our 2023 experience. And, uh, and you've seen some pictures of me. I love to uh, go hiking in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so I uh, had, a, had a hike there a couple of years ago that really felt so much like our ACO journey. And so I tend to share it whenever I have a chance to be able to do so. Um, and one of those things that we have noticed, we've been in ACO since 2014, is that change is constant. And from my personal perspective, it's always an uphill battle. And that's why you see it, because this is this is exactly what I feel like most of the time. Like I'm trying to climb up a you know a, a rock face with moss on it, and it's just it's just a challenge. And and that you know the thing is is that really in this world, it's all about the persistence. Persistence is absolutely necessary. And also, it, it's been amazing over what's now, all, you know, going on 10-year experience is how much certain things, even though change is constant, there are also certain other constants in our experience. And that's really about, it's all about right data, right place, right time, right resources, and, and being able to pull all these different pieces together from our electronic medical records and our health information exchanges to closed loop referral patterns, you know, using of telehealth. So we have everything that we need at point of care for our physicians and to help them manage their patients best. And, and thinking about this in the complexities of an aging population that tends to have rising costs, rising utilization, et cetera. And, and thinking about all these processes while at the same time maintaining this focus on the importance of the doctor-patient relationship. Because personally, from my perspective, that's where healing comes from, is maintaining that, that relationship. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about this, we are uh, entirely independent practicing physicians. So we have our physician board and myself. So this is really a lot of the, our initiatives, our peer-to-peer -peer recommendations. And just as I said, some things are consistent. So are our goals. Our goals over the last 10 years have really been about reducing hospital, you know, pre preventable hospital uh, admissions, you know, ER visits, getting those readmission rates under under control, you know, keeping home health appropriate, and and driving improved quality metrics overall, and and then maximizing that that workforce because we've always had challenges and now workforce challenges are even greater than what they have been in the past. So how do we take a limited workforce and really utilize their skill sets to that maximum? 
And what we have learned over this particular journey is the importance of keep it simple. The, the more focused we can keep our physicians on direct patient care and then reduce some of this other burden by being able to have other people delegated to do some of this work so that way we're all working at the top of our license has, has really created some, some better efficiencies and workflows. And, and then making sure we break down those processes. So, okay, leave it to me to feel like I'm always climbing, you know, that, that very, you know, cliff place, but, you know, breaking it down for our practices. So that way they, they have, you know, rocks and, you know, smaller boulders. It's, it's easier for them to navigate and to work with than it is when they have to then having too big, too big a piece. And, and the other thing that we have found that was really essential for success is, is building processes within existing workflows. Because anything that you can keep within an existing workflow within a practice has really generated much greater results than when we've gone in and said, okay, we've got a new process, we've got to do this. And that takes so much energy, a lot of reinforcement to build, not that it can't be done, it can, but it, it, to be able to have that become consistent, that's about persistent energy, reinforcing that knowledge education piece that needs to be done when you're building new workflows. So our goals are keep it simple and keep it within existing workflows as much as possible um, and, and delegate where we can. Next slide, please. So in thinking about this, what, you know, because like I said, our goals have always been the same. And, and we did a lot of work in the beginning where we're just, you know, educate that practice, you know, educate our, patient, our patients, you know, call your doctor first, do all those things. And it moved the needle, but not really enough. So then we said, okay, well, what's the next place? So we started looking at our readmission rates that were too high and found that sepsis and heart failure were our top two reasons for readmissions. And so we chose heart failure because that's a outpatiently, a, a, an amenable diagnosis for treating on an outpatient basis. And, and, our, and our group is, is comfortable with that. So we took that and I went with our, our, our traditional analytics. We pulled all of our heart failure patients and said, okay, here's your list of heart failure patients. Let's, you know, see them more frequently. And, and that began to work, but we still got pushback because when you go over those lists with the docs, they're like, well, these three patients are really stable. Why do I need to fill up some of my office time when, when they're really doing okay? And so I recognize that we, we've done a better job. We've identified a group of patients, but yet what we need is that we need to refine this process better. And I was at a conference and I heard health data analytics do a presentation. Of course, this is the slide I saw, you know, and this, and it was like, oh my gosh, this resonates because I feel like I'm in a fog all the time. And it's like, they, they, they're, they're offering me clarity. They're offering that they can help me identify a better subset of patients to be able to focus on, to be able to use our resources and, and to be able to really great, make a greater impact. So thus those patients are going to do better. They're going to thrive. We're going to, you know, mitigate what's happening and be able to then drive overall success. Um, so next slide. Go ahead, Holly. Oh, Garrett, can you pop up our first poll question, please? All right, here we go. We've got a question that's coming up here that you will see on your screen. And these are, uh, this is a click all that apply or check that all that apply. These are uh, anonymous, by the way. So um, you don't need to worry about that. And we're going to show the results so you can kind of see where you stack among your colleagues. So we're going to give it just a, under a second. We've got a bunch of results coming in here. This is what challenges do you face in managing your high-risk patients? Again, click all that apply. And we've still got some results coming in. We'll give it about <clears throat> five more really long seconds. And we'll go ahead and uh, share the results. We still got the results coming in here. Interesting. Okay. All right. We're going to shut it down in about five, four, three, two and one and i'm going to go ahead and share the results and 
Dr. Magoon and Romanus, you should be able to see those on your screen. Yes, yes. So the number one was unnecessary hospital admissions and ED visits. Number two is balancing resources of staff and patient ratios. Three is lack of availability of time slots for follow-up appointments, which is a huge component. I, I mean, just as an aside, I mean, that's that's a huge thing my docs would talk about is I got to do all these different things and there just isn't enough time in a day. That is that is a huge component for all our practices. And then putting together time lists for number four and none of the above was, was minimal. So congratulations to those who have that uh, accomplished. Uh, very good. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So this is, you know, where we are today. But what happened is when we engaged um, health data analytics, I, I have to say I was a kid in a candy store. And so what happened is like now it's like I got all these high risk patients. I mean, they actually stratified our whole patients, high risk, average risk, low risk. It was really cool based on a whole slew of different condition topics from ERs to admissions to fall risks, as you can see, heart failure, my, my favorite topic, um, and pneumonia, you know, adverse kidney or ki kidney issues, cardiac, mortality, I, I'm not even going to get them all. Romanus could recite them all, and I'm, I'm not going to get There's like 20, 25 things out there. It's, it's phenomenal. And so me, because now I'm like so excited because now we've got these cohorts and my clinical mind is thinking about all these wonderful processes and projects we could put together. I take this list and I take probably about 10 of my curiosities, I will call them at this point now. It wasn't at that time I thought was thinking differently to our doctors and said, okay, look at all this cool stuff. Look at how we can now take these high risk patients and we can work with them. And, it, and at first it was like everybody was excited and they're looking at it and they're talking about it. And, and then I realized, you know, the needle's not really moving the first time I took it out. And I was sitting down with one doctor and he smiles and says, you know, this is beautiful. You've done a lot of work. This is great. But you know what? I can't do 10 things. I can only do one. I can only do one thing. So what's the one thing we're going to do? And so anyways, with that, what we did is then he and I negotiated down what was going to be the one thing and not just the one thing for him, but the one thing for the overall organization. If we could just do one out of 10 things, what would make a difference? And we decided to work with unplanned hospital admissions. Those just those patients that are at high risk for that doesn't matter what their underlying disease processes are. But so we'll take all patients that are just at high risk. And as you can see, I mean, this is, you know, a list that we fully de-identified. That list is not overwhelming for anybody. Anybody can handle 10 patients kinds of things. And so, so then he was like, okay, let's do, let's just work with just that. And he already had an existing workflow for patients that were at high risk of a hospital admission because of some of the Medicare Advantage work that his practice was doing. And, and then in talking to other practices, because of the Medicare Advantage work that they were doing, they already had a process in place for patients that were at high risk for an unplanned admission and that already had a follow-up cadence schedule. And so they could, there, there was this whole built-in knowledge base on what to do with these patients. And so what we did is we just decided to do look at four things. So this this is exactly the list that then has been was going out. So unplanned admissions, and then because of our concerns with heart failure, we're not letting that go. But now it's looking at heart failure in the the space of an unplanned admission. And yeah, I kept a couple extra on there just because I couldn't give it up. But I didn't ask them to do anything other than just to be aware. And then I kept two other places, pieces that I thought could make a difference for us that can be delegated out to their nursing staff. So patients that are at high risk of having a pneumonia, then because pneumonias in our simple pneumonias are in our top 10 reasons for hospital admissions, let's just have that list go to the nursing staff and make sure those patients have already had their pneumonia vaccine schedules completed. And fall risk, since that is also a quality measure, for those patients that are at high risk for an adverse, let's just do more than the three question screen. 
let's let's actually do a, a you know a, a, a more full assessments let's let's do you know get up and goes or tug tests or a variety of other things like that or or a home um questionnaire regarding do you have you know rugs and all those other kinds of things but that could also be done by the nursing staff when they're doing their IWVs, when they're doing some other things with their patients or however he want they want their their care coordinators to do that or or our care coordinators that we embed in their practices so once we got that that defined that was really really i got had really good acceptance i now did not get pushed back unless for some reason we accidentally kept someone on there that was deceased um but you know the 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 you know the lists were highly accepted they worked within many practices workflows and for those that didn't already have one it was really just about let's just bring these patients in more frequently if you have ccm or if you have some sort of you know nurse call program where we can put them in our nurse call program started work those additional touch points and then what was exciting of course because this is romanus's business he's like hey we can we can even refine your lists a little further so go to the next slide and romanus is going to tell you what other kinds of great work that that they oh before you do that you will see these numbers look pretty different because it's like oh my gosh all your patients were in a program it's like no we actually chose to use our not only our attributed list but our potentially attributed list because we anticipate because of churn that happens within the ACL of people coming up and on quarterly, we figured we should just go after the whole population. So we actually went off of our full uh, potentially attributable uh, population as well. Go ahead, Romanus. Thank you so much, Dr. Magoon. So um, in addition to identifying the highest um, risk patients for an unplanned admission, um, we took Dr. Magoon's list and at scale, we placed patients in these specific cohorts of which combines historical information like patient demographics, conditions, and utilization history, uh, and, and put them into these buckets to see here on the top left. Uh, the three cohorts we identified were advanced illness care, complex care, and rising risk. Um, this breakdown really uh, provided some additional insight in terms of which groups were at a higher risk of mortality and likelihood of entering hospice, which represented about 28% of the population that fit this criteria, where the conversations may not be maybe different right um it should be suited best for advanced care planning uh goals of care discussions uh, typically are the ones that may take priority for some of these cases and about 68 percent represented the complex care bucket those folks had a top were at the top 25th percentile at risk for an unplanned admission naturally this is the group where you would target for chronic care management disease management programs uh heart failure pneumonia um, falls risk even, you know, everything applies uh, that Dr. Magoon had pointed out earlier. Um, and also, you know, remote patient monitoring and annual wellness visits priority. Um, and in some cases for patients that were in this bucket that haven't seen their doctor in the last month, in the last quarter, you know, how do we set up a, a quarterly cadence of, of them following with these, uh, with their physicians? The remaining 5% uh, of the patients were in the rising risk bucket where their predicted risks were not as high as the other groups. And so you would keep an eye on them, but really prioritize the first two groups. Um, overall, in, in a way, this, this added a layer of information that allowed care teams uh, to focus not just on their outreach, but ultimately their appropriate conversations and services for these, uh, for, for these sub cohort of patients. Um, Dr. Magoon, other than your awesome, simple message to your providers and care managers to provide extra TLC uh, yes. for these patients, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, <laughs> that that was that was the big one. I, I yeah. you know we just we just really encourage them to because it's really from from like I said everything is relation to me is relationship based in medicine and the stronger and the more supportive relationship you know the the compassionate relationship that you show to your patients it, it's very meaningful and it does help you know help them in regards to their overall well-being and their compliance etc and and so yes and it was helping practices develop chronic care management programs instituting some remote patient monitoring and and having those those patient groups broken down into those subsets it made it a lot easier to say here these are the appropriate patients and this is why and so that also created greater acceptance for adding additional modalities Excellent. go ahead thank you dr Magoon. So um, to Dr. Magoon's, I think, first slide, uh, we know change is difficult. And to echo Dr. Magoon's pay earlier, it is an uphill battle, uh, right? And, and so we were fortunate enough to really 
worked with Dr. McGoon, who had and continues to have an effective care management team process and care coordination structure uh, in place. And so there was very, very minimal effort uh, and interruption into their workflow, uh, which includes obviously their, their physician practices. Uh, the programs and resources were all there. Um, and our really our value add was to ever so slightly tweak who they targeted and prioritized care for. And, and they executed very, very well. Uh, the general thought, uh, Dr. Magoon, throughout this entire project was that Dr. Magoon saying, give me a simple patient list and I'll take care of the rest. Uh, that's, that's the constant thought, uh, thought throughout this project. Um, uh, next slide, please. If there's nothing to add, Dr. Magoon. No, that's it. And this was this was so exciting, and I, I, I'll, I, I'll I'll give Roman it. He can oh, no. he can go over the numbers, but it was just like okay, we're getting. Cause so you know what I do is I keep up there. I keep this simple list for six months. I start in April, and and that's just my personal start. You know, quality measure time is over. We got to start working, and then I keep it until October, and then October is the next the next high risk patient list for the next six months. And so it's like, okay, we're getting ready to switch out the list, see who's still on, see who's falling off. And it's like, well, let's, I know my internal numbers are looking like we're trending in the right direction, but let's see what this cohort has specifically done. So I asked Romanus to yeah. see if they could run their internal, how we had been doing for six months, this population six months prior to initiating this formal program and this formal you know, set of patient lists and how we're doing now. So that was, I have to say, a very happy phone call. So Romanus, you can relive it a second time. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, no surprise here, good execution will always lead to good results. And thanks to Dr. Magoon's discipline of really just taking, again, a, a different approach to patient targeting. Um, it was almost really feeding information to a well-oiled machine, uh, <laughs> for lack of better words. Uh, the, 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 um, the results speak for themselves, but also we took it a step further and breaking it down by which cohort was impacted the most. No surprise here uh, was that uh, the advanced illness care was uh, the one that showed the, the largest amount of impact in terms of ED visits and unplanned admissions. And, and rightfully so, because this is the most expensive group of patients um, uh, typically um, that far extend way above your complex care patients as well as your rising risk. Um, so um, yeah. This is this was a this was really great to see. Um, next slide, please. And then yeah, ultimately, yeah. go ahead. Oh, go ahead, and then I'll finish. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, very quickly. Um, so continuing this, how do I say this? This intelligent path of identifying and targeting patients. Um, Dr. Magoon was really kind enough to include us on this innovations project called Healthy at Home, and Dr. Magoon will provide additional details here. Um, where services for both social and medical will be provided for senior patients in their homes. That includes exploring some of CMS's um, PIN services for really uh, health-related social needs. Um, in executing this type of model, you know, taking what we have done with Dr. Magoon in terms of virtual calls, or rather, you know, um, calls by phone and not being physically present in the patient's home, I am certain this model of care will continue to yield results, not just for the advanced illness population where you are seeing the most impact, but let's be honest, um, I'm, I'm overly confident, uh, Dr. Magoon, that we'll see an impact for the complex care group of patients because now it's no longer calls. It's this is physically in their homes and really, you know, touching these patients uh, and being, you know, ha finding meaningful conversations to really drive change. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that. And ultimately, I know Dr. Magoon's thinking this, that this is the type of project which could potentially lead to uh, result in uh, a research paper being published. Um, sorry, Mark, Dr. Magoon, I spoke a little too much into this. This is your baby. Just, I'm excited too. <laughs> so yes, no, no, we're, we're really excited. Because yeah. the thing is, is that, so we're, we're gonna keep exactly our base because we know that's successful and we know that works. And and so essentially what you see from my previous list is, is essentially what's going out. There'll be one little modification to that. So we're gonna keep it. So we still want our docs seeing their high, free, their, their high risk patients a little more often. Uh, having that breakdown for these are the patients that go into remote monitoring. These are the ones that go into, you know, that are having the nurse touch points, whether it's t telephone calls or chronic care management or whatever that happens to be. But now we're going to, uh, Romanus and team is going to now take this subs, this patient set and then identify those patients that are at the highest risk of having an adverse event in the next 90 days. 
because that's where this we we want to learn how to and 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 we're using this principal illness navigation service um this code that cms has to be able to go in the home for those patients that are expected to have something bad happen in that 90 day period and to be able to intervene to be able to do that social needs assessment to be able to do those very personalized care plans that are expected to be part of this this billing code to to be able to help assist those patients their med recs their education you know whatever those particular need sets are and and to be so that they can be healthy at home and that's that's our goal and so anyways that's that's that next piece that we're really excited about is is getting that additional you know cohort refinement done so that way we know these are the ones we need to target in, and then sending um, the nurses out there uh, to be able to do those assessments and so we're we're really excited about this next this this next iteration of our particular care coordination program, care management program. And so that's what we're hoping in a year from now, we'll, we'll have some data to share. We'll, we'll find out, we'll, we'll find out what successes and what, what challenges and opportunities we have, but that's how we're gonna learn is by getting out there and by doing it. So thank you, um, next slide. Thank you so much. It's so fun as a listener to hear the two of you bounce back and forth off, off of each other. And I really enjoyed uh, what you shared. And we can't wait to do another one of these in a year and look at your future results, Dr. Magoon. Um, Garrett, could you please open up the next poll question? Got it. All right. So it is up and should be on your screen. And this one is, is your organization participating in any of the newly covered health related social needs services and billing appropriately? It's a mouthful. Uh, this is a, a select all that apply, just like the last one. And again, this is these are anonymous. And so we'll show the uh, the results here in a moment so you can kind of see where you stack up among your colleagues. But we'll give it a second for some of the results to come through. And by the way, we'll, uh, <clears throat> if you watch the session later, when we'll send the recording out to everyone, then of course you'll be able to see these, the results of these polls that are captured in that recording as well. Okay, looks like we've still got a couple responses coming in. I'm gonna give it about another five seconds here, five long seconds, and then shut it down, give me five, four, three, two, and one. And I'm going to go ahead and shut it down and share the results. Okay. So looks like right. the majority, majority of people are going, are doing um, some, are doing a social health assessment, social determinants assessment. Um, there's some people who are not familiar with these new these new G codes and they just came effective here for 2024. So it's a it's a learning process for for all of us. And then we do there are so there are a few that are doing um, the community health integration services as well as the principal illness navigation services. So thank you. That is that is wonderful. Excellent. Um, next slide, please. So Holly, thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, HDAI, we're a care optimization company and our mission is to unlock value and care with robust analytics like you've seen here today. Um, and also our AI integrated platform, Health Vision. We are one of a handful of, of for-profit companies who have earned access to Medicare's full data set. And we utilize that with our digital twinning approach, which is our unique approach to finding actionable insights um, to identify areas of opportunity, not only at the patient level, like we've looked at today, but also at the organization and provider level. Our modeling framework uh, has been covered in numerous peer reviewed articles that support the transparency required for responsible AI in healthcare. Uh, we do share this information on our website and on LinkedIn. It's all open. If you are interested in learning more or discussing any of this, please let me know and I'm happy to share these publications with you. And then lastly, Health Vision analyzes the patient's medical history and creates an intelligent health record. It's a concise one-page summary, the patient spotlight, that shows the patient's 
information from their chart and specific clinical risks all in one area so you don't have to dig through the EMR. Um, so through our utilization of this intelligent health management system, we're collaborating with leading systems to help reduce uh, admissions, post-discharge mortality, length of stay, and really working to help ease clinician workloads and, and fight burnout. Holly, can um, I just interrupt there for a moment? Sure. And put that slide back up? Of course. Because, I, and this I did not touch on because I was going over how we were handling our high risk. This is something that our care coordinators at the ACO, they have access to for their phone calls. And this has been really beneficial for them because it gives them a broader longitudinal view of the patient than what they see inside the physician's um, electronic medical record. And they have found this very helpful because it not only lets them know what those disease processes are and those what they're at risk of getting um, what what could actually go wrong or you know at risk of developing but it also had medication in there so they could see gaps in the fills of their medication so we have found this piece and i know this wasn't the the primary focus of today but this has been really helpful for our care coordinators and so i just wanted to expand on that a little bit thank you so much thank you so much that's wonderful well, I think we're back on track timing-wise. Garrett, um, I'll turn it back over to you. We can open it up for Q&A and open discussion. Wonderful, yes, and we did have some, some questions that came in, and by the way, if you do have a question for either of our speakers uh, or just in general, go ahead and drop it in now uh, to your uh, module there that has a, a place actually for questions, and we're gonna get to as many as we can. Uh, I know we got off to a little late start, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in no particular order, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, what is your care management structure like and how did you incorporate the new programs? Okay, so our care management, our care management structure is what I call a hybrid model because we do have internal care coordinators that are embedded okay. into different practices. Like really and so what happened is that, you know, and some of our practices have their own care coordinators. So if the practice has their own care coordinators, we work directly with them. If they don't and they need help, then we will um, embed care coordinators within our, within our practices. Wonderful. Uh, sorry about that. My, uh, That's okay. we're still experiencing a little technical issues on, on my end. So I, I dropped out of some of that, but hopefully that came through. Uh, Next question is, uh, did this change uh, put additional strain on your clinical staff? Um, it, well, that's where, when, when we initially took our broader list out, yes, that did. Uh, but when we narrowed it down so that way it was really about unplanned hospital admissions, it worked well within the existing practice workflows because they already had those established. So that didn't really add any significant strain on the practices because it was a because that's why i said if you can work within an existing workflow then adding adding five patients adding 10 patients it, it, it was not huge volume for any one particular physician that that didn't seem to be an issue now our staff or some of the care coordinators then had some additional volume uh, of patients that they're outreaching to but we at least for our staff had that already had some capacity had some space that was available within their, you know, their their day, their time allocations. And for those offices that had their also their own care coordinators, they seemed to absorb it without any, I didn't get any pushback on those. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, all right, next question here is, uh, during this process or through this process, did you identify any patients that you weren't already aware of? Yes. I mean, some of them they were, but there were those that they, um, yeah, that, that they were like, oh, okay. It, it was, it, yeah, because some of them they were very much aware. And the high, those, those that uh, Romanis had identified in that highest advanced risk group, those nobody questioned about. Those were all well known. It was more of those that were in that chronic piece and in the right in that small rising risk piece that they 
weren't on the physician's radar. But I, it probably and because we've had, a, you know, a, a tenure with the particular physicians we're working with, they gave us the benefit of the doubt that these patients that have been identified at high risk, they were willing to go ahead and work with them. And I, like I said, I didn't get a lot of argument. And the fact that now we've been seeing success with it, uh, that, that has also helped us as well. But yes, the, the, those particular categories is where we found some patients that they weren't aware of. Yeah, great. Uh, okay, next question here is, um, we have an ED frequent flyer list and you know, and know who our high risk, uh, high cost patients are. Can this still be helpful? It can be. It's all a matter of how you work. We That's what we historically worked with is like, who's our ER frequent flyers that are there? Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, in our experience, some of those that were the highest frequent flyers have, have some sort of behavioral health component to it that really challenged us and be able to um, successfully impact um, those individuals. And that's why we changed our methodology over to, you know, uh, working with health data analytics is because we needed to have a group of patients, a subset of patients where we could actually have benefits to the amount of, le of, of effort and and time and funds and resources that we were putting into the patient. So not that those aren't valuable and not that those don't need help. It was just, we needed a subset where we knew we could really make a difference. And so that's, I, I you, they all need help. It's just a matter of, if you've got lots of resources and you can put resources across the board for all those patient populations, that is fantastic. That is great. I don't have that kind of, you know, um, unlimited resources. And so we needed to look at where we had the biggest, you know, bang for our energy. And uh, I would like to add to that really quickly, because uh, I, yes, I am, I've experienced my own when I was on the provider side of uh, looking at ED frequent flyer lists. There comes a point where if a patient's been to the emergency room 11 times in the last year, that, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tough case to manage. Um, but, but, for those cases that aren't as you know intense on that end of the spectrum, for cases that are constantly uh, you know obviously cycling through the emergency room, uh, I, I would say the Health Vision platform not only identifies their level of risk and tying in a, uh, a you know a 95 risk uh, risk for an unplanned admission or an ED visit, but the top contributing factors is probably the most powerful thing in in, in terms of giving the clinician. Yes, they're going to the emergency room for, for their diabetes, for hypertension. Yes, th those are, you know, le legit reasons why. But there are also the top contributing factors kind of allows the, uh, the, uh, the provider to position themselves to perhaps have a different conversation, to maybe, you know, think ahead in terms of having uh, these conversations around their symptom management for hypertension and diabetes, um, which really is quite powerful and could change the likelihood and probability of a patient experiencing yet another ED visit. You know, there's the mental health component there, which you do have to overcome in some circumstances, but this addresses the medical piece, which is sometimes, I don't want to say just as hard as the social piece, because the social piece is its own, uh, you know, um, um, thing, but uh, it takes one less thing off a clinician's plate. It's not easy, but it's, it does that bit. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, okay, next question here is, uh, does your practice have a standard work process to refer patients to care navigation if it's not embedded in the practice already? Um, I, I, at this point, I am managing the ACO, so I do that full time. And I also have an independent physician association, so I'm not currently practicing. Um, and um, But we do in regards to if we have a practice that wants to work with our nurses, we actually have a closed loop referral platform that we use that they can communicate through. We do that for our care transitions because we have one care transitions nurse that works across um, the majority of our population. And so uh, that is a uh, referral in and out. And so we use that closed loop referral platform because it's all self-contained, all the information's there. Everybody on the care team that's working with that patient is on it. So it's not just, so if it's like a hospital care transitions, uh, we even have one hospital that actually works with that same platform. So that goes out as a collaborative referral to our care transitions nurse, to the practice, if there's a specialist involved. So 
that is what we use as for for that particular piece as well as we okay. can use it for other kinds of 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 you know sharing of data that we need to across uh across because we all have they're all different emrs out there sure. and so we have just used that as essentially a glue to hold some of this together great Next question is, uh, how do you keep your behavioral health population from utilizing the ED? Ooh, that's a, I thought, that's a doozy. I don't have an answer for that one. That, that <laughs> one, that's something we've looked at a couple of times. Actually, I shouldn't say it down. We actually, um, for a few years, were able to um, have somebody that was able to provide uh, behavioral, we were doing um, behavioral health integration. And so we had started that as a pilot so we could actually have a behavioral care manager that would reach out to patients and, and took on our own patient load. Um, I've just had a hard time keeping that position staffed. And, um, and, and maybe that's just part of our environment because of where we're located at. And there's a lot of people getting hired away to take care of, uh, well, we'll just say, um, uh, you know, some of, some of the people who have greater needs from our, our government's uh, point of view, but anyways, um, it, it's just it, it, it that is a that is a challenge, and uh, we we have an idea of how we could help you know that, but we just don't have the staffing capabilities to do it. Sure. Yeah, that's one of those uh, wicked problems, as they say. That's uh, that's just hard to yeah. hard to find a solution for. Yeah, and um, it, and it's hard to find okay, staff. next question here, and this is actually uh, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, next question here, and this is. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having audio issues, so I may be starting to talk over you inadvertently. My, my apologies. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? I was just going to say having enough behavioral health. Staffing or, or resources in a community is is a challenge for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. Uh, next question here is, um, and this is more on the on the technical side, so this may be something we have to get back to you. Uh, is how do you get to the patient body view in Health Vision? We partner with HDAI and would love to use that feature. Um. Okay, I was going to say, I could almost look through and see how it, Romanis is probably better, but there's, if it, there's where you can actually click on the patient, and then when you click on the patient and you go into it, then, um, then, then it'll give you a variety of different views within the platform, so you can see when their admits are, when their ERs, what their risks are, it'll go over their meds. There's, I was going to say, if you just, if you just get with Romanis and team, they can walk you through how to get that particular point of, yeah. of information. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, I can see it. Yeah, I don't use it every yeah. day. My nurses do. It's the spotlight but, view. Um, basic, yeah. It's the spotlight view to Dr. Magoon's point, and it basically summarizes the history of the patient, you know, allowing the doctor to gain that much more visibility of what's hap hap happening around their office. So it's called the spotlight view. There isn't a physical person. Um, <laughs> Uh, in that in that view, but all of the information that you saw in that image is literally what that reflects, uh, and it's it's uh, it's done in a way that um, speaks around utilization, onset of clinical diseases, as well as any adverse events. Um, again, happy to show that <laughs> uh, visual. Great. Um, okay, next question here is. Um, what are the working hours for these care coordinators? Do you have a 24 hour assistance if needed? Um, the, the ones that work out of um, our particular office are usually, you know, Monday through Friday, eight to five. Uh, our care transitions nurse, uh, we have some cross coverage for. So we do have some Saturday, Sunday hours. At this point, um, the practices that we work with and they, they are the ones who provide evening coverage, you know, as, as part of their on-call process. Those that have their own care coordinators, those run on a whole variety of different programs. Uh, some of our offices have nurses that, you know, have a phone and they just have a rotating, 
you know, who, who's on, who's the one on call today and they have a rotating phone. So it works differently depending upon the different offices that we're working with versus what we do internally. Garrett, you're muted. I'm sorry. Of, of course yeah, I am. Yeah. Of course I am. <laughs> All right. Next question here is, uh, uh, what type of education did you provide to keep these patients out of the hospital? And how did uh, you provide the help that was needed for SDOH issues? Or as far as education, you know, education was really, you know, because we have practice education and then there's the, the patient education piece. So patient education is really going to be from from our standpoint is that our, our, when, our care, when our care coordinators or their care coordinators are talking to them, it's really about those assessments, those conversations. What does the patient need? Uh, we have worked with an organization called, and I may not have the name correct, I think it's like TMF Healthcare. They're one of the um, uh, Medicare's quinquios. They, they really have some great um, education pieces. They call them spotlights. They have red, green, yellow uh, kinds of things uh, for different health conditions, medications, et cetera. So we use a lot of their tools uh, because they've been vetted in, in regards to that patient education piece. And, um, and I probably have lost part of the question in my head. And um, as, was that for ED or what was that for, patient education? So it said, uh, what type of education did you, did you provide to keep these patients out of the hospital? And how did you provide that help that was needed for SDOH? So, okay, so keeping out of the hospital, so, so that was it. We, we use those TMF tools in regards to their disease process, their meds, those things. So, and, and it was really, and then when you're talking to them, it's like, call, call, call your nurse, call your doctor, call your office, you know, first, you know, anytime that you have. So it's still not that you give up that call your doctor first campaign. That's always there, um, you know, as, as part of that. But it, I think the real reason for keeping people out of the hospital was they just didn't have the need to go because they were feeling better. They were doing better and functioning better. Um, and as far as SDOH, so yes, we, we have a basic um, SDOH screening that we uh, use. And then it was really about identifying, that has been a real challenge for us. I wanna create my own, um, somebody who used to have something called a blue book of, of resources. Um, so it's really just been you know, coming up with everybody just working together, where can we get financial assistance for getting you know, medications? Or where can we get financial assistance for getting your utilities covered for a month or rent assistance? And it's really just been everybody pulling together, creating lists, and you know, hey, they still have availability. Working with our uh, local um, area agency of aging, sometimes they can provide help and help and assistance. There's just we have, I mean, and then now there's something. What is it called? Find help, I think it is. Uh, that that varies in regards to its its um, function or its ability to provide you resources based on your different communities. But um, those are some different ways. It's it's just. I, it's kind of what I consider a scrappy process. You just go, you start going through, finding it, creating a list, and then sharing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time for questions. And uh, I wanted to, if you, by the way, if you do have a question that you still want answered, go ahead and, and, and submit it now. We're, someone will get to you uh, via email. But uh, I wanted to thank our speakers. Thank you guys so much. This is a, a fantastic presentation. There's a lot here. Uh, and um, I, again, thank you all for sticking with us during our technical issues kind of throughout and, and especially at the beginning. So thanks for bearing with us. Uh, as we close out here, wanted to encourage you all to head over to vbcexhibithall.com and check out the uh, HDAI virtual exhibit booth there. This is a, a really cool resource that you can uh, just read up on them, see what they're doing in the space. There's a lot of uh, uh, different articles and things that they've done, and, and you can really uh, educate yourself on them. And of course, there's ways to, to reach out to them through there as well. And if you would like to reach out uh, to uh, the HDAI team, uh, feel free to do that. Um, Holly, if I could have you go to the very last slide. 
Where is that at? Well, you see it, Garrett? Uh, I did advance the slide. On okay, my well, side, either way, feel free okay. to reach out to them. Their information is. Ah, there it is. We're just. <laughs> we're, we're just at the mercy of this thing today, but uh, yes, um, no, feel free to reach out to our speakers today or to Holly. We're very live, but uh, appreciate you guys sticking with us. Feel free to reach out to them directly if you would like, or to me, I'm happy to facilitate an introduction for you if that's easier. But again, I want to thank you all so much for spending your afternoon with us today. Hope you join us for the next one, which I can almost guarantee will go a little smoother uh, with the technicalities. But thank you all for your patience and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.